U-G-L-O-W. Now this is abstraction, okay? Because no one's body does that. No one's, unless you like study yoga all your life or something like that. But you know, the, the perfect pyramid shape, actually the painting is called pyramid. The pyramid shape of her body, it's positioned, look at the verticals and the horizontals on the picture. This is how the picture is composed. She's between rectangles. See the rectangles in the yellow wall back there? The way they create what's called plumb lines. So you can figure out the verticals and the horizontal relationships. The way these circles on the floor are measurement, but they also describe the space. You guys all see that, right? Yeah? Who doesn't see it? Okay, good. Who? Who you don't see it back there? Do you not see it? Do you want me to explain it again? You know what? I can't hear a word you're saying. Okay. You see the this, this shape of the woman, right? She's sort of hunched over, right? Look at where these verticals, you see in the yellow wall behind her? Look at the way the verticals touch the body. It's a classic way of how to describe a curve. You draw a bunch of evenly spaced vertical lines so you can figure out the track of the curve. That's what Uglo is doing here. And these lines have a direct relationship to the circles on the floor. So the painting has its own internal sense of measurement based on the verticals and the horizontals of the lines. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another one. The floor, look at the way the line in the middle cuts right through the middle of her body. So he can figure out the ellipse of her breast based on its relationship to that line behind her. And you can even see the sort of tension, these little marks here. He's using the imagined verticals and horizontals in the picture. They're called plumb lines to organize the curve. So the curves in the painting are based on the verticals and horizontals that he is either putting into the background, putting into the floor, or imagining. This is Bryce Martin once again. The way the line touches the edge, as if the four walls of the canvas, the four sides of the canvas act like the barrier. Matisse talks about something called the fifth mark, right? There are four marks already in a canvas. The four sides of the canvas are the first four marks. The fifth mark is the mark the artist makes, right? So you have four marks, two horizontals and two verticals. The fifth mark is the mark inside. And Bryce Martin, in his work, he touches the edges, but he doesn't go off the edges of the canvas because he's respecting the edge and he's respecting the fifth mark of the canvas. This is Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, if any of you have the opportunity to go to Venice in the next month, um, hey, it could happen. You know what I mean? Let's talk about abundance. Let's talk about the things we can have. Let's not talk about the things we can't have, OK? So if any of you get the chance to go to Venice, Mr. Gonzalez Torres has the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Mr. Gonzalez died of AIDS in 1989. This piece is called North. It's um, light bulbs in porcelain sockets suspended from the wall of the gallery to create a wall in between you and the other wall of the gallery, similar to a border. And it's called North. So if you're in South America, this might be the border between South and North America. Okay. Two more pieces by Gonzalez Torres. On my right is called Leaves of Grass for Walt Whitman. Here, this one is called Lover Boys. It's two strands of lights that share a socket, but the line falls into pools on the floor. So the line, right, is expressed through these lights on the floor. But also, they're two of the same thing. So it might talk about uh, a same-sex pairing. And the piece is called Lover Boys. So he's using these very humble materials to express a relationship just with light, light bulbs and sockets. Okay. Everybody talks about uh, expressiveness of line, and I think that that's related to the character of the artist. Like, you see artworks by artists and you recognize them because of their character, because of their hand, because of their signature. This is Bruce Nauman, and this is a neon sign where the, when it is activated, the two people are poking each other in the eye. 
And um, so it has a sense of movement in animation, but neon is Nauman's signature material. What's neon for? What's it used for? Signage, and what do signs do? They address you, right? They tell you to pay attention. So he's trying to tell you something about aggression here, and he's asking you to pay attention. And plus, it's really funny to watch these people poke each other in the eye. Okay. This is Keith Haring. Okay. And this is from, um, this is uh, in New York, back when you could afford to live in New York. Um, there used to be these subway walls that had, um, where posters were, and people would rip them down, and there'd be like a black material, so you could put posters up. And Keith Haring began to draw on these with these incredibly toxic, beautiful black permanent markers that they don't make anymore, right? So he developed this style of drawing that's based on the marker and based on graffiti. But he's able to express all these different ideas with a limited number of symbols and a limited number of uh, gestures. So he's e even able to make this idea about the crucifixion out of these very generalized symbols. This is Crum, our Crum. These are blues musicians. And they're all done in his signature idiom. So every time you see a crumb drawing, you would recognize it because of the way he creates texture, the flat color in the background, the sort of idea that um, color plus black will equal a shadow. And we'll talk a little bit more about color next week. Now this is Ava Hess. Okay. Ava Hess is probably the most important sculptor of the 20th century. Yeah. And um, she died of brain cancer when she was in her 30s. She was uh, working with latex, sprayed latex, sprayed fiberglass, all these different materials that were industrial materials that people didn't know very much about. So she's in there working without a respirator because no one knew that they were toxic. But, but in addition to her sculpting life, she had these very amazing abstract drawings of the forms that she was making. So she could imagine these forms in three dimensions in drawing. On the right, over there, is um, her sculpture that was installed at uh, her only solo show at the Stable Gallery in New York. And these are drawings based on that sculpture. So you can see how she's working with the idea of something inside of something else, something that turns into something else. All these things are at work in her drawings, and then they're expressed in her sculpture. Some of the different ways line is used, talk about contour, cross contour, cross hatching. And what these do is they help build texture, create mass, and build forms. This is Sargent. Okay. Um, he's pretty good. Okay. He's not my favorite, but he's pretty good. We all know who my favorite is. But you look at the way the contour here, the strength of this line here, gives the weight of the body. And the way the, the, the frenetic activity in the background, that sort of cross-hatching in the background starts to build up form, right? You can really see the cross-hatching at work in Van Gogh. Van Gogh is drawing with a reed pen, which is like one of those pens that you dip in ink and you draw with. So it has a very short duration, the mark. Because the duration of the mark is so short, he's got to work very quickly to build this kind of form. And you can see how all the marks are netted together to create mass. And the more the marks are netted together, the more form is created. Look at the, the amount of space in that drawing. You know, how close up this feels, how far away that feels, and all the different marks he uses, and all these different directionalities. You know. This is Ugo Rondinone. This drawing is 10 feet high and 14 feet long. And this is black ink on paper. So it's not just the cross-hatching of the mark, it's the distance between the marks that creates space. So these marks are closer together, which is why it looks darker. These marks are further apart, that's why it looks lighter. I have a detail of this so you can see there may be like two different values of ink. There's like a, a medium tone and a dark tone that are deployed next to each other to create this idea of space. This is via Selman's. These are drawings of the ocean and graphite pencil. She's not well. Like, that's sort of insane. You know what I mean? The amount of detail that's there. 
but you know, she doesn't have a horizon. She doesn't have anything. So all she has is texture and the diminution of size. So the waves get smaller and lighter as they move back, which is what creates that idea of space. Yeah. So she's not using cross-hatching. She's just blending the mark, so it's absolutely seamless. Yes? The, sc the size of them or the scale of them? The size of them. They're smaller than this. So this drawing in real life is probably about 25 inches by 22 inches. Now, talking about cross contour, this is Terry Winters. Okay. Now, he's drawing, this is like, um, you know when you watch uh, the weather on Channel 5 when the hurricane's coming, you know, and they have all these like 3D models of what the hurricane looks like? It's really a cross contour drawing. How this line on the outside describes the edge of the form, but then these lines on the inside describe the internal relationship of the form. They're drawn across the form. And you really see this. It has its fullest expression in Degas. Okay. Degas kind of weird with the ballerina thing. I'm not that crazy about that stuff because like the ballerinas are like little girls and who's this old man in the corner drawing them? Not so much. But I have to talk about him because he is a good example of cross contour. But he's a bit of a perv. Okay. Um, you see the way the, the line goes across her body? The texture of the mark goes across her body? instead of just on the outside. It goes across her bum, not just around her bum. So he's drawing across the form in order to make a fuller relationship. Now this is Giacometti. And Giacometti is one of my favorite artists because nobody liked to correct a mistake more than Giacometti. You, know, you can see him, he's like, is it this line? Is it this line? Is it this line? Maybe it's this line. Oh, well, it's all the lines together. You know, so he's building this form out of these concatenations of lines. After this aggregation of lines comes form. As these lines are built on top of each other, this starts to turn in space. And it's flat. You're just putting one line next to another line, next to another line, next to another line. And eventually it starts to turn in space. And that's the amazing thing about him, is that he's just trying to correct his mistakes. And in looking at it and in trying to correct it, he ends up developing form. Shape. Okay. Any questions about line? And the crowd went what? What? No. <laughs> no. No questions about line, man. Oh, you're very sweet. You get an A. Okay. Shape. The last artist, Alberto Giacometti. There's a huge retrospective on him at the Museum of Modern Art five years ago and there's a huge catalog up in the library. Huge. Shape is the result of a line cl closing on itself. Compositions can be thought of as an arrangement of shapes in the visual field. An arrangement of shapes in the visual field. Not an arrangement of things, not an arrangement of objects, an arrangement of shapes. Because we're talking about two-dimensional design here. All these shapes are flat. Even the light that's projected is flat. So we're talking about an arrangement of shapes in the visual field. The properties of shapes are outline and contour. And there's a very key difference between the two of them. A contour drawing expresses every facet of the shape. An outline is just the outer seaming of the shape. When you're in, when you're in drawing class and you start drawing and you draw the outside of something, and your teacher says, draw it from the inside out, and you look at your teacher like she's smoking crack or something, you know, but that's what she's talking about. She's talking about drawing and looking at a form and drawing the front, the back, the middle, and the side of it all at the same time. And that's contour drawing. And this is a very good example. Kara, once again, that's the outline, right? Which, which one's the outline? No. This is the outline, right? Can you see Mickey's head? You see the outward shape of Mickey's head, right? That could be the shadow of a parking meter, for all you know. You know what I mean? Yeah. But with Kara Walker, you have a sense of those legs coming forward. You have a sense of the body in three dimensions. And that's the difference between contour and outline. And I'm not saying that contour can't be interesting. I'm not saying that outline can't be interesting. Keith Herring makes...